While it's important, more than ever, for humanity to mitigate our ecological impact as much as possible, in hopes of saving the planet, it's also a good idea to prepare for the worst, and to be able to bounce back from that. So today we're going to be covering climate resilience, and something that I don't think is talked about enough, ecological fail-saves. I must affirm that it's still important to reduce our impact on the planet as much as possible. We desperately need to speed up the transition to green energy, to rethink how our food and transport systems work, to overhaul how we produce and consume, and what we do with our waste. All efforts to achieve these should continue. However, at the same time, we must be prepared for the worst case scenario. Regardless of socioeconomic circumstances, it's going to take a long time to fully transition our society into a truly sustainable one. And the ecological clock is ticking. Fast. Hence, we need to plan ahead and enact measures that secure the future of human society and preserve natural flora and fauna, especially endangered species. The main areas I'm going to focus on in this video are conservation of wildlife and climate adaptation. I will talk about them separately. There are many ways in which human societies can and will need to adapt to rapidly changing climates and ecological decline, if we are to survive as a species and as a functioning civilization. Many challenges and hazards we will face in the coming decades that contradict our current way of doing things. The first example of this is the fact that, since we've found its benefit, many major cities and population centres are coastal, or are otherwise in proximity to large bodies of water. Sea level rise represents a challenge for these places, and the situation is even more dire for those living on island nations. The main risk here is flooding, and in the case of islands, potentially full submersion which in either case can be devastating, especially when these things affect a large number of people. There are two main measures we can use to protect coastal communities from this hazard. These are seawalls and mangroves. Perhaps the most famous example of seawalls are the Dutch seawalls, or the Asfluid Dyke, which began construction in the late 1920s. Seawalls aren't really that high-tech, but they have, in fact, protected many parts of the Netherlands especially considering that significant portions of the country's landmass lie below sea level. Sea walls could take many forms and be constructed out of any material strong enough to weather the waves, which I imagine would vary by locale. The more natural alternative to sea walls is something called a mangrove. These biological structures consist of trees and shrubs that slow the speed of oncoming winds and waves and allow coastal soils to absorb water. These could also potentially protect, and even create, natural coastal habitats. Both seawalls and mangroves can also be employed together to create a robust coastal flood defence system that can protect land habitats and large human populations. But there's more to contend with than sea level rise. Another big challenge we will face in the coming decades is food security. The primary threats here are drought, flooding, soil degradation, and ocean acidification. These are complex problems that seem difficult to overcome, but with the right techniques and solutions, we can adapt to these conditions if need be. In some regions around the world, food is grown where there is little rainfall. These areas are drought prone, and their population's food security is arguably the most vulnerable. To combat drought, we have a few tools at our disposal with our current technical capacity. Perhaps the simplest solution, albeit quite the undertaking, is the artificial irrigation of agricultural land. If we can create artificial rivers and other bodies of water in drought-prone areas, we can create a permanent source of water for areas that rely on it. In fact, why not go a step further and have water be desalinated at the nearest coast or major water source and pumped into a potable reservoir ready for use. This would make the water both drinkable and usable for agriculture at the source, which is very handy, especially in more impoverished regions that do not have adequate water infrastructure. However, some regions face the opposite issue, where severe floods destroy crops. 
irrigation can help here too, but to serve a different purpose. In areas prone to flooding, water needs to be drained as efficiently as possible away from food sources. Storm drains are a good example of this kind of infrastructure and have been proven highly effective at reducing things like flooding. However, rainfall from heavy storms could also be stored and processed into more drinking and agricultural water, reducing its scarcity. Storm drains, along with infrastructure such as dams, can drain what would be flood water into artificial aquifers and reservoirs, and if carefully engineered to reduce environmental impact, could potentially be used for hydropower and energy storage. Soil degradation is primarily caused by the depletion of micronutrients from arable land. The depletion is mainly caused by conventional agricultural practices, namely monoculture. Our farming practices ever since the inception of agriculture, at least in many parts of the globe, have involved effectively taking nutrients from land but never replenishing them. That was until the advent of fertilizer, although conventional inorganic fertilizers also have their own issues, such as being prone to runoff. There exists a class of plants called nitrogen fixers. These take nitrogen out of the air and convert it into substances that serve as plant nutrients. When these plants eventually die off, their captured nitrogen gets replenished back into the soil to be used by other crops as fertilizer. What I've just described is a type of polyculture, where different plants, perhaps even multiple crops, symbiotically benefit each other in various ways. Nitrogen fixing plants are an example of this, but a similar thing actually happens in forests with the relationship between trees and networks of mycelium, though mycelium and mushrooms are fungi, not plants as such. The logical conclusion to polyculture is permaculture, which uses ecological principles to create self-maintaining food systems. It's about understanding the relationships between plants and other living things and how that can benefit us humans in terms of food in the long run. An example of permaculture could be mixing crops with flowering plants. These flowering plants provide nectar for bees, which stabilizes bee populations, which in turn aids in cross-pollination. Bonus points if these flowering plants also fix nitrogen from the air and capture pollutants from soil. The last item on the list of climate adaptations I'd like to go over is the ability for us as a technological civilization to adapt to extreme temperatures. Heating, ventilation and air conditioning, or HVAC, has been the traditional toolkit for climate control in indoor spaces. However, these require immense amounts of energy that today is still often generated by fossil fuels. While yes, the world is slowly transitioning to renewables, it's also worth considering more passive alternatives to HVAC, which can also work outdoors. Geothermal and solar heating are passive methods of generating heat that require little to no electricity to be effective at heating an enclosed space. Geothermal can also double as underfloor heating, which provides a more even distribution of heat than conventional heating methods. Passive solar systems can be used to heat water or to provide heat using a few different methods, such as taking advantage of large panes of glass, i.e. large windows and skylights, to transfer heat energy indoors. The heat can also be transferred using something like copper piping, and indeed metals like copper can be used to accumulate solar heat for use if engineered in specific ways. Because of thermodynamics, getting rid of heat, or any kind of energy for that matter, is always going to be easier than generating those. In the coming years, what's going to happen, or for many regions, what is already happening, is the increase in frequency and severity of extreme heat during summer months. When considering passive cooling techniques, it's important in the context of climate adaptation that we apply passive cooling to both outdoor and indoor settings. There are a few building techniques we can use to passively cool buildings, which I will go over now. Today, many buildings of multiple uses are made of glass, steel and concrete, especially high-rise buildings. The problem with this is that glass, while looking supposedly pretty to modern architects, is also a great insulator of heat, hence why it's great for greenhouses and solar heaters. Buildings designed this way become sun traps, 
as they absorb heat from the sun quicker than that heat can be dissipated. This often means that energy intensive HVAC needs to be applied. Consider instead that we design buildings in hotter climates so as to maximize shade, built in block, and painted in lighter colors to reflect many wavelengths of light. Many buildings can also have shady facades to provide both outdoor shade and reduce incoming solar radiation. Concrete and materials with similar thermal properties act as heat sinks when not exposed to a heat source, and this could be exploited by using said materials as flooring, or in some cases, even using earthen floors for a similar purpose. Speaking of earthen, shade is also a very important consideration outside as well as in. This can be achieved via trees and other tall foliage, or artificial structures scattered around for people and other beings to rest and take shelter under. When all these are combined, it creates an environment that is passively cool, where it would otherwise be at a significantly higher temperature on average, which is obviously going to come in handy for hotter regions in the coming decades. So far this episode, I've discussed how the needs of humanity can be catered to in an increasingly hostile climate. However, we must also very much consider the well-being of other fauna and flora that inhabit this earth, and how we can safeguard them to ensure the future of the ecosphere. As humans, we have demonstrated the capacity for ecological destruction. However, we also possess the capability to be caretakers and stewards of our world. Here's a few ways how. According to the WWF's 2022 report, wildlife populations have declined by almost 70% since 1970. In layman's terms, Natural habitats and biodiversity are in deep shit. There are a couple of lines of defense we can use to protect endangered species from extinction. A traditional and predominant way of doing conservation is through wildlife sanctuaries. These are spaces where endangered species are taken into captivity so that they are insulated from the conditions that are causing their decline. Many of these sanctuaries also adopt breeding programs in order to stabilize and increase the population of an endangered species. In order for this to be an effective ecological failsafe, it needs to be scaled up. There needs to be an active, global, fully resourced effort to stabilize populations and reintroduce these species into the wild. However, in more dire circumstances, we'll have to look to alternatives. The next ecological failsafe I'm going to be talking about is embryo banking. This is where embryos of an endangered species are frozen and stored in case the species goes extinct. This is already done in some cases, however, in order for this to be a thorough and effective ecological failsafe, it again needs to be scaled up. In fact, the world already does large-scale organism preservation just not for animals. Since 2008, the Svalbard Seed Vault has stored more than 1.1 million varieties of plant seeds. In the case of an apocalyptic event, such as devastating climate change or nuclear warfare, if at any time a species of crop or other plant went extinct for whatever reason, seeds of that plant could be retrieved from the vault and be used to revive the existence of that crop. If we can do this for seeds, why not for embryos? Imagine a similar scaled embryo bank that contained a whole catalogue of species that could be revived if they ever went extinct. This would be the ultimate ecological failsafe, with the only downside being that it needs a constant and reliable power supply that lasts for a long period of time. If these vaults were positioned at the poles, for half the year they could be supplied by constant solar energy, with excess energy being stored in either thermal or electrochemical batteries. For the other half of the year, perhaps small nuclear reactors could be used to power the facilities when there is no sun. Situating these embryo banks at the poles would also have the added benefit of being naturally cold, which would aid in cryopreservation, as with the Svalbard Seed Vault. However, 
this would only need to be employed in the worst case scenario. In order to prevent this, we can take measures to restore the world's ecology in various ways, such as rewilding, species reintroduction, and reducing ocean acidification through things like liming, as well as increasing the population of shellfish and actively regenerating coral reefs. Some key examples of things we will need to achieve in terms of ecological restoration are things like reforesting the Amazon rainforest and restoring the Great Barrier Reef. Reef restoration is important in particular because not only do they serve as a powerful carbon sink, but they also provide cumulatively half of the world's oxygen, which is obviously very important. All in all, while the future of our planet definitely looks bleak, it's not impossible for us to use our technical know-how and understanding of ecology to help combat its decline and aid in its recovery. And if we radically apply the adaptation techniques I mentioned in this video, human civilization may very well weather the coming ecological storm.